Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Microsoft Patch Tuesday Crypto API Vulnerability Overview. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Jake Williams and Johannes Ulrich. Johannes will be moderating today's webcast. Hello, and everybody, that, and, like and thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Johannes here, and I'm happy that uh, Jake uh, Sands uh, advisor here will uh, run actually this webcast for us, and he has prepared some material to tell you a little bit about uh, these uh, vulnerability here. Uh, we do have four questions, uh, two options here at the bottom of the screen. You should see a Q and A icon. Please uh, click that for questions. Do not use the chat. The chat is uh, to send us messages otherwise, but for questions, please use uh, the Q&A icon. There will be a recording available of uh, this uh, webcast. Uh, we also will make the slides available. So just the same link that you used to register for the webcast, that will work uh, to access the recording after the webcast concluded. And with that, uh, I just want to hand it off to Jake. Hey, thanks so much, Carol and Johannes. Uh, greatly appreciated. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about the uh, crypto API flaw. Um, this is one that, uh, I, man, there was a lot of hype coming in around this initially. Um, and then we backed off a little bit, it felt like, and, and now there's a lot of folks that are kind of like not a big deal. Uh, I got to tell you, it's sitting right smack in the middle between, uh, it is maybe not the biggest hype of the year, but, uh, well, actually it's 2020. It must be the biggest hype of the year. It's the first patch Tuesday. Um, but, but there is still a, this is still a significant vulnerability, and we want to walk through uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the ins and outs of this. I can tell you from taking calls from clients yesterday um, that, that fundamentally uh, they don't understand the impact of the vulnerability, um, and, and that's really what we wanted to get out there uh, today uh, with the Sands Institute. So I want to thank the Sands Institute for uh, letting us, uh, or sorry, for uh, bringing this uh, content uh, to the community. Uh, very quickly here uh, to kind of walk through. Uh, just a quick agenda. What is the vulnerability? Uh, we know that the vulnerability impacts ECC. A lot of folks don't know what that is. Um, I had several calls yesterday uh, from clients asking about, uh, well, if we use RSA certificates, uh, then we're good, right? And the answer there, the short answer is no. Uh, I want to walk you through a couple of attack scenarios, right? Uh, how could this actually be uh, be attacked? Um, and then uh, go from there. And of course, uh, as always, feel free to use this collateral, uh, you know, with, with your management or to brief your stakeholders, whatever. So, so why are we here? Uh, yesterday, uh, Microsoft patched a vulnerability involving certificate validation. It's CVE 2020-0601. Uh, and allows an attacker to bypass that certificate validation, uh, potentially leading to HTTPS man in the middle. Uh, we may be able to bypass some whitelisting controls as well as other uh, information. Uh, Jake, uh, we have some complaints that your audio is a little bit uh, too low. Uh, could you try too to speak low. up a little bit? Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, how about. Uh, Look, how sounds this, fine right? for me, but uh, just try to speak yep. up a little bit, maybe. Uh, I guess I will uh, I will definitely speak up. I was trying to make sure I didn't overdrive, uh, overdrive my mic here. Hold on one second. Let me see if I've got my. Let me try this here real quick. Uh, test, test, test. How, how does that sound? Any better? Louder? Shorter? Softer. Definitely louder, uh, maybe louder. on the too loud side, but people can always turn down their volume. So okay, okay. rock on. Thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stick with uh, stick with this here, and we'll, we'll see if that uh, uh, see if that plays better. Okay, perfect. Um, so okay, so uh, again, the vulnerability uh, that we've got here, uh, CV 2020-0601, uh, could allow an attacker to bypass uh, certificate validation. Again, HTTPS man in the middle is a definite concern. Uh, bypass of whitelisting controls, again, a definite concern. Um, and then, of course, the big one here is the installation of malicious software updates. And we want to walk through that one in particular um, because we think that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest threat that most people are going to face. Um, according to Microsoft, the vulnerability only impacts ECC certificates and certificates using RSA, uh, basically the RSA algorithm, are, are not impacted. That's the certificate validation of those certificates themselves. Um, we'll walk through about the RSA uh, piece here in a moment. So is all certificate validation on Windows broken? This is probably uh, one of those slides that you can use, uh, again, from a collateral standpoint uh, to communicate with stakeholders. Um, it's only certificate validation is the crypto API that's impacted. That, that's the good news. Um, the bad news is most certificate validation on Windows uses the crypto API, right? So it's kind of a good news, bad news kind of scenario there. Um, but there are a lot of spots that aren't vulnerable. Some third-party software uses libraries that don't directly rely on the API. Um, those won't be vulnerable. Uh, certificate validation performed in the Windows kernel. There's not an 
I shouldn't say there's not a lot of this, the majority of the certificate validation occurs in user space. Um, because crypto API sits in user space versus kernel space, um, the, uh, basically the kernel space uh, stuff is, is, not, uh, is not broken at all. Um, the uh, certificate validation uh, that's uh, used, uh, ba excuse, the certificates that are used pinning, providing the pinning is done properly, um, those should also not be vulnerable, right? Now, uh, if you're not familiar with certificate pinning, uh, this basically is where rather than saying any trusted certificate, you say only certificates with, basically only certificates with these, uh, basically these fingerprints or these signatures, right? Um, and I'll mention here that uh, even though the forward certificate will appear to be valid through the crypto API. So in this scenario, we are looking at uh, a certificate that uh, has been presented um, as or a signature that's been presented as a piece of uh, piece of software, uh, software uh, based certificate validation there. Uh, the crypto API is going to say, hey, uh, this is a valid certificate, meaning it's part of that uh, certificate chain of trust. But because the fingerprint doesn't match what's pinned, um, again, basically it's gonna, what we're going to see here um, is that anything that does pinning properly is not going to be vulnerable here. Windows updates specifically are not vulnerable, right? This is something that we had, I, I can't tell you how many questions about, um, you know, and uh, this is probably because of Flame. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Flame, um, this, is a, uh, th this is a piece of malware that emerged on the scene in 2012. Um, and uh, probably the big thing around Flame was terminal services licensing. I mean, Flame is, is a fascinating piece of malware anyway, uh, but the terminal services licensing was a big deal there. And basically attackers were able to uh, extract a certificate um, from terminal services licensing and then trick uh, Windows into installing updates, believing malicious updates, believing that this uh, basically this update signed with this key from terminal services licensing um, was actually a legitimate code signing certificate. Um, Microsoft did a ridiculous amount of work, including certificate pinning um, in their updates, uh, Windows update mechanism to make sure this didn't happen again. So even though the crypto API flaw exists in user space, um, and <clears throat> even though crypto API exists in user space, um, and the uh, basically end the uh, excuse me, the update mechanism runs in user space as well. Um, because of the certificate pinning work that was done, we don't believe that Windows updates are vulnerable. Um, and, and again, this, this has lots of reasons for this, but uh, there are lots of reasons for this, but pinning is, is probably the biggest one. So I wanna talk quickly about ECC. What is ECC in the first place? Um, ECC is elliptic curve cryptography. Um, and then there's ECDSA, which is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, right? Now, this is where stuff gets mathy uh, very quickly. I'm not going to deep, deep, deep dive on math because one, I'm not a mathematician. And two, it doesn't really matter for the vulnerability other than wanted to make sure that you are math uh, or ECC smart enough to talk about what it is versus, uh, versus RSA. Um, so the, the traditional asymmetric key, uh, traditional asymmetric key exchange uh, you know, type or asymmetric cryptography um, is RSA, right? And RSA relies on factoring ridiculously large numbers, um, whereas cracking ECDSA uh, basically involves solving what we call, or sorry, an ECDSA key uh, involves solving the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. And mathematicians have been making huge advances in factoring, uh, Gaussian sieves, et cetera. Um, there haven't really been substantial advances to solving ECDLP. And what this means is that because and we talk about solving, you know, this factoring thing is what we call an NP hard uh, factoring. A co prime is, is what we call an NP hard problem or NP complete, uh, which means that we know how to brute force the problem, but we know how to solve it in exponential uh, exponential time. So linear time versus exponential time. Um, because math, mathematicians have been making strides in solving uh, solving this factoring issue, um, the uh, basically this this EC uh, ECDSA or ECDLP problem specifically has kind of come into vogue. Uh, what that means is we can use much smaller keys than RSA. A 256-bit ECDSA key provides about the same protection as a 3072-bit RSA key. Uh, for those that are, are not aware, um, when you or don't have a cryptography at all background, um, when we go and uh, basically connect to a remote, cert, remote web server, of course, we're all familiar with TLS um, and the certificates used to protect TL or basically used to secure that TLS session. That's asymmetric cryptography that's used to exchange a symmetric key uh, that we then use for the rest of the communications, right? Um, and so uh, here we can use a 256-bit key 
uh, basically to go exchange a symmetric key versus a 3072-bit RSA key. Now, 384-bit ECDSA keys are coming into vogue as well, but you get the idea here. Much smaller keys means faster computation, lower server overhead. All right, so, so one of the questions we fielded a lot yesterday, which is what if our software app or whatever uses RSA certificates, we're good, right? Ah, um, here's the problem, right? The issue here is not what certificate your app uses, right? The issue is that an attacker can forge a certificate knowing that the, or forge a signature, um, knowing with specially crafted certificates, I'm gonna back up here, that they can forge a certificate, forge a signature using a specially crafted certificate. Knowing that an attacker can do this, right? Um, an attacker, obviously, if they're in a position to forge a certificate, is not going to forge an RSA certificate. They're going to forge a ECC certificate. And so it is technically true that the parsing error only impacts ECC certificates. Um, but uh, what, what, of course, is going to happen here is um, they're going to obviously forge one of the vulnerable ones, uh, ECDSA. Um, and that will allow them to go uh, basically spoof uh, or bypass the identity check that's being performed by the crypto API. Remember, certificates are fundamentally an identity check. All right? We have, of course, a root of trust. Um, and uh, basically going back up to our CA roots, uh, we have that root of trust and, and basically backing all the way up there. So because we're looking here at an identity problem uh, by being able to spoof the identity, the, the way I analogize this to several customers yesterday is that when you go clear customs and border protection, uh, CBP, they ask you to show your passport, right? Um, now, in the old days, you used to have to flash your passport or they would look at your passport and stamp it. Today, it's, it's those, all those little machines or you have global entry, but, but picture for a moment that you had a forged passport. Right, um, and, and actually, maybe a better analogy of this is is the uh, the real ID. Right, um, you know, we have uh, obviously a TSA won't let uh, folks without the uh, government mandated real ID uh, use that to fly uh, anymore. Uh, coming soon, I believe, or, or maybe already happened here. Um, I know it's been in the news recently with the real ID. Uh, picture that real IDs are are secure and can't be forged, but but things that aren't real IDs could be. And I know that's the actual concern. Again, this is an identity document that proves you are who you say you are. Certificates are very much the same thing. It's an identity document that proves this piece of software um, was signed by somebody in control of, of, of this certificate. Right? And so again, if we can spoof the identity check, we know attackers are, are not going to uh, try to spoof an RSA certificate because they're not vulnerable. That said, just because you use an RSA certificate doesn't mean that app isn't at issue if the attacker has a man in the middle position. One of the questions we had as well was how quickly will this be weaponized? Now, again, I, I'm not a mathematician. I've been through the, uh, uh, been through the patch. Um, I've got a pretty good idea of, of, of where, some, uh, where some stuff is at there. Um, woke up sick yesterday, so didn't spend as much time on it as I had uh, as, as I'd hoped to. The good old flu, uh, flu light or whatever we're calling it going around. Thankfully, I feel much better today, but, but alas, I haven't done as much on that as I would have liked to. Um, I, I will mention um, that in around uh, seven hours, uh, six and a half hours here, it looks like an independent researcher was able to generate a working proof of concept. Now, um, I, I'm not claiming that this for sure is a real proof of concept. It could be a hoax, right? They could have placed a rogue CA certificate in the root certificate store. I don't believe that to be the case, uh, knowing the individuals involved. Um, but, uh, but hey, uh, rock on. And by the way, Evil Core um, as a code signing authority uh, is just awesome, right? So, 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 uh, so hats off there on the uh, uh, hats off there on the pun. The short of it is NSA uh, basically said that adversaries would be able to quickly weaponize this. Um, it, it looks like that is actually the case. Um, so that said, patch, 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 right? And I actually have some good news uh, for you here. Uh, on the good news side, um, Microsoft created a function in Windows 10 called CVE Event Write, and it does exactly what it sounds like. When, when Microsoft discovers a a new very problematic vulnerability like this, um, they ultimately will then, at least in the Windows 10 side, and, and good news, it's only Windows 10 that's vulnerable in this particular case. Um, of course, bad news, uh, if you're counting on Windows 7 being the, uh, you know, basically being the, the go-to there, um, of course, support died for that, uh, or normal support died for that yesterday. Uh, CV event write facilitates the writing of a new log entry, the application event log. Um, you can target other uh, log providers, but by default, it's application event log, and here it certainly will be. We reviewed the code here. Uh, prior to the patch, CV event write wasn't imported at all into Crypt32, uh, but the patch version uses the function, right? Um, and, and I'll say this, uh, you know, in, in SANS, uh, and certainly in exploit development in general, we do a lot of what we call patch diffing. Uh, if you've taken the 760 course, uh, you know all about this. Uh, if you haven't, that's that's where we teach it. Um, but uh, but alas, um, you know, the uh, this leaving this function here or adding this function 
uh, makes it a little bit easier to find the vulnerability because it's, it's basically backing up from that, uh, from that function. That said, um, this is a huge, huge benefit to defenders because once we've installed the patches, this gives us a piece of instrumentation that we didn't have before, right? Traditionally, when we drop a, uh, drop a patch in um, and install that patch, traditionally, the, the issue that we run into there um, is that uh, great, we're secure now, but how do we know if somebody's trying to attack us? In cyber threat intelligence, we talk a lot about uh, the detection and discovery courses of action. Detection is future complement, discovery is past complement. Um, we'll talk a little bit here about how to go detect uh, forged certificates um, in, in a moment. It's a little bit labor intensive, but I'm sure somebody will script that out very quickly. Um, that said, um, when we get into, uh, uh, basically when we get into the patched version, the detection going forward, um, we actually have quite a benefit here because Microsoft is, is now beginning to add, at least for some of the more major vulnerabilities, um, this CVE event right. So, so again, it does make discovery of the vulnerability in the patch a little bit easier. Um, but, but again, on balance, it's such a benefit for defenders. Um, I, I can't, uh, can't fault Microsoft here at all. I'm loving this, right? Um, and so look, the attackers were gonna use binary diffing tools like Vindiff to go find this stuff anyway. Um, and so uh, in fact, um, yeah, that was, Huge, huge, very easy to find uh, here with Bindiff. They, they created a bunch of new functions um, that didn't exist in the old crypto, uh, sorry, crypto32.dll and the crypto API. Um, but here in event logs, uh, what you're going to see here effectively, the message will always contain uh, that CV 2020-0601 cert validation. We've got a chunk of the code uh, from, uh, from Ida Pro right there. Um, yes, uh, my friends over at uh, that place, I, I didn't use Ghidra. Uh, sorry, st still not uh, still not 100% there, particularly when it comes to symbol resolution, right? Um, so, uh, but uh, the source name is going to be Microsoft Windows Audit CVE or just Audit CVE in general. And you can see there that you're going to get uh, the basically the CA name um, and then the fingerprint of the certificate, right? Um, the other parameters, uh, I'm not going to say are not important, uh, but you'll know what certificate uh, created. And then very importantly, um, the uh, CVE event right uh, message there or CVE event right uh, API call um, logs the uh, process ID um, and even thread ID um, of the, uh, basically of the <clears throat> uh, process and thread that generated the alert, right? So you'll be able to track down very, very easily. The good news is once you install the patch, if somebody does try to exploit you with this, um, you'll be able to track down very, very easily where that occurred. I think this is great because, uh, well, great for a lot of reasons, um, but, uh, <clears throat> I would say the biggest problem is um, most people don't forward their application event logs, right? Um, so uh, the other big thing is that no application logs are gonna be written until the patch is applied. Um, we know that the only mitigation for this is applying the patch. Um, you know, I, I hate to be that guy that's like, hey, apply the patch, um, you know, uh, because it, patching, I don't wanna say patching is, is hard, uh, but it is in a lot of uh, very large organizations. We, we know this because we regularly find unpatched machines and red team assessments. and. Um, you know, again, it, patching is, is, is hard, right? So, so I don't want to be the guy that's like, hey, deploy your patches, you're going to get pwned. But, but the reality is that um, this one is going to be easy to weaponize, uh, I, I think at least. Uh, I trust NSA on that. Um, I, I trust uh, the fact that there's folks working on it. And, and again, the fact that um, in, in minutes you can see where the, uh, you know, basically where the vulnerability lies with, with, with patch diff, right? Um, so all that's standing between you and that is, is, is some math and debugging. Um, Basically here, this is only going to be useful in detecting attempted exploitation of the patch machines. Um, again, you know, don't use this as a, as, as kind of a spray and pray thing and say, well, okay, good news. Um, you know, event logging will save the day. Uh, it's not going to here. Um, I'll also mention that in uh, most organizations we work with, um, the, I'd say the majority of the organizations we work with, uh, folks do not forward the, uh, do not forward their application event logs to the SIM. Um, and, and I understand that because there's a lot of noise in your average uh, event log. Um, but I'm just going to say here that uh, I would probably set up a filter to forward anything that has the word CVE in it um, from my application logs uh, to the SIM. Now, there's other ways, of course, that you could set up filters here. You know, it doesn't have to be a filter like that. You can filter on event type, whatever the case is. Um, but, but be aware that this is here. Um, and, and then you can conclusively, once you've patched, uh, if you're forwarding, you can conclusively answer the question, did someone try to hit us with this? after, uh, you know, basically uh, after the patch release. Now, NSA and Microsoft both said that there's no evidence of exploitation of this in the wild. Um, so, you know, at least uh, taking that at face value, any exploitation attempts we see would have come after the patch, uh, after the patch was released. Um, so, um, NSA uh, notes that uh, for the NSA advisory, um, they note that ECDSA certificates um, that use named elliptic curves can be ruled as benign. 
Um, and so we show using cert -Util with ASN, uh, basically the ASN switch to go dump out a certificate. Um, they show the command there, um, but I'll tell you, it is a little bit difficult for a lot of folks to go dig into um, what, does that, uh, what does that mean? Um, the ECDSA, or basically that uh, discrete, uh, <clears throat> you know, basically discrete logarithmic uh, function there, um, basically what you're doing there is a search across that, uh, basically a search across that, that elliptic curve. Um, and, and it is a very, very difficult thing to do. It turns out all elliptic curves are not made equally. Um, and uh, smart, very, very smart mathematicians figure all that out. Um, and uh, there are a number of curves that are named uh, NIST. Uh, provides a number of these, and you can see here this ECDSA P384 is actually a NIST provided uh, NIST provided curve. All right, so so the question is, which curve are we using? As long as it's a named curve, they say, hey, um, you should be good to go. You can rule that benign. All right, um, so uh, I, I can't validate that 100% at this point. Like I said, uh, I didn't do as much patch dipping as I had hoped to, uh, and diving into creating a proof of concept uh, last night. I wouldn't be sharing it anyway. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, investigating certificates here, again, uh, if you didn't know whether or not that was a good named curve, um, you can ask CertUtil to display the known named curves, right, um, as well as how large the public key is, and you can go match all that up um, with the ASN output. Um, now, again, I'm not sure how useful this is going to be on an individual basis, but I expect some of our vendors are going to be uh, quickly automating this, um, you know, in, in the very near future. I expect, uh, you know, some, some folks like, again, in the NetWitness side and other network monitoring, uh, network monitoring tools will we'll probably build this out, All right? So I want to walk through some of the attack scenarios here, because th this is what I, I answered. I can't even remember how many times yesterday to customers. What are our most uh, likely attack scenarios with this, right? Um, we think that most attack scenarios will involve some level of man in the middle. That's not to say that all attack scenarios do, but the most probable ones, the ones that I'm the most worried about um, that didn't rely on an attack for already being on my machine, um, again, are the man in the middle ones. Man in the middle can obviously happen anywhere. But I have to tell you that uh, folks that are in uh, the US and uh, North America, European Union, uh, typically uh, I, we're, we're what I'm gonna call ISP privileged, right? Um, and uh, you know, a lot of folks don't worry about um, and don't have a reason to worry about um, their, uh, their ISPs, their internet service providers. Um, I, I'm not sure whether or not that's a mistake. Uh, regardless, uh, I'll just tell you that, uh, you know, for some level of man in the middle, uh, or there is some level of man in the middle uh, concern uh, that's elevated when you're outside of the States and outside of the European Union. Um, we d used to do a lot of work over in uh, a few countries in Southeast Asia. I uh, saw this firsthand. Uh, you know, it, it takes very, very little uh, funding wise to go buy off an ISP employee. Um, and suddenly you're not hacking an ISP, uh, although their security generally um, as you move out is, is a little bit less too. Um, but, but literally you're just buying access at an ISP, which is, uh, wow, um, it changes your threat model, right? When I talk to folks in the US, it is very rare when they're like, yes, my ISP is part of my threat model. I think when you ask folks and say, hey, should you be worried about your ISP? They're like, yeah, but I got things I'm gonna worry about way more than that, right? Um, you move over uh, outside of the US here and, and the, the, uh, the game changes quite a bit, right? I'll also mention Rogue Warriors use public Wi-Fi, including in-flight Wi-Fi would also be at elevated risk for this because obviously they're elevated risk for man in the middle. Um, lots of folks ask, what about a VPN? Um, you know, the reality is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens, you know, between the time automatically, right? Uh, you request for software update, et cetera. When you boot your machine between the time that you, uh, you know, move through the captive portal, whatever that happens to be, whether the Starbucks or GoGo in-flight internet or whatever, right? There's a lot of stuff that happens between you or that may be happening on your machine without your knowledge um, between you cap, uh, finishing that captive portal, uh, being out on the internet, um, and then your VPN finally, uh, you know, finally connecting there, right? So, so I would say still at elevated risk, even if you're using a VPN, although obviously VPN uh, better than no VPN, right? So let's talk quickly about the first scenario, man in the middle, network man in the middle. Here the attacker's in a privileged position um, in the network and can intercept traffic between the vulnerable machine and the legitimate server. And the attacker is going to forge an ECDSA certificate for le the legitimate site. Um, the crypto API is going to go validate that as a legitimate certificate. The attacker now has full access to the plain text traffic um, because they issue symmetric keys. Obviously, uh, we talked earlier about the fact that the asymmetric, uh, you know, uh, basically the asymmetric encryption is used as a key exchange for symmetric keys uh, used to go protect that session data. 
And at this point now, the attacker has full, uh, full access to that data that you, you thought was encrypted. Uh, meanwhile, again, it is a trusted cert, right? Um, so, so when we say, is this trusted, is it not? This is technically a trusted certificate. Um, I, I say technically trusted. It appears to the crypto API to be a trusted certificate. That is the vulnerability, right? Um, so do I think phishing, uh, you know, like uh, phishing attackers or folks that are using, uh, you know, credential harvesting or whatever are going to use this? No, I don't think so. Uh, well, let me back up there and say it depends on how long it takes before a public proof of concept is out there. Um, the, the delta between the, the time to patch and the time that's going to be out, I think is, uh, I think a lot of folks are taking this seriously. Um, and I don't think that we're going to see a lot of attackers uh, try this. Um, and uh, we'll see. I mean, but, but the short of it is from a nation state side, right? If your concern is more, uh, more nation state, more advanced persistent threat style, uh, style attacks, then I'm much, much more concerned about this, right? So, so a lot of this comes down to what is your threat model uh, from a, you know, again, without a public proof of concept uh, being out there, I, I don't think this one's going to be weaponized quickly um, by your script kitties, uh, script kitties, script kitties don't weaponize anything by, by your ankle biter uh, style attacker. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, cyber crime style, uh, you know, low hanging fruit attacker. Um, but uh, you get into nation state style, absolutely. Um, this, this is a, a great vulnerability or could be a great vulnerability to use. Um, now, of course, there are problems here, right? Or potential problems here for the attacker. Um, it's only Win 10 in, in server uh, server 2016 slash 2019 that are impacted. Uh, you know, obviously anything legacy is, is not. Um, and so, you know, they, they of course run a risk here. If you're, if you're thinking from the attacker standpoint, the risk trade-off, um, they're running a little bit of a risk here that uh, ultimately they project this, this forged certificate to something that, that does uh, proper certificate validation, it's not impacted by this flaw. Um, so, so that obviously could, uh, could, could be an issue or would be an issue for the attacker. Um, the, another big one here is application whitelisting bypass. Um, every time, every time somebody gets hacked, uh, it, it's literally a race to uh, race to somebody saying, "Well, were they using app whitelisting?" And I get it, I totally get it. Um, whitelisting and, and strict whitelisting, uh, if you ever worked in an enterprise environment, is harder than it sounds. Um, but uh, but yes, uh, we do know folks that, that are doing that in, in very high security environments. Um, you know, the attacker has access to the vulnerable system or is delivered an executable to the vulnerable system. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, we post exploitation stuff. So phase seven in the cyber kill chain, trademark. Uh, the, uh, I guess I have to, to give, uh, pay my dues now to, uh, to Lockheed, uh, since that's the cyber kill chain. But alas, uh, stage seven in the cyber kill chain, uh, basically as they're doing actions on objectives, the attacker shouldn't be able to execute a particular program uh, because the whitelisting software or the whitelisting controls that reside uh, rely on certificates. But because the app whitelisting solution relies on the crypto API, uh, the malicious app is allowed to go execute without restrictions, right? Obviously concerning there as well. Okay, th this is the big one for me, the coup de grace. This is the malicious software update. Again, Windows update, not vulnerable. Right? Uh, and that's because of the amount of work that they did uh, to ensure certificate pinning uh, through, uh, through Windows Update. But the attacker is in a privileged position in the network and can intercept the request for a software update. Um, we used to teach this all the time in, um, all the time in 660 uh, and 504, I think we mentioned it as well. There, there's a tool, it's kind of dying on the vine now um, because you know, of, of ubiquitous encryption, uh, but there's a tool called Evil Grade, or sorry, ISR Evil Grade, um, evil grade, like an upgrade, but evil. Um, but ISR evil grade, and the whole idea behind ISR evil grade um, was to basically uh, make this whole process of intercepting a, a software update request and then serving a malicious update uh, much, much easier, right? Um, and so much, much easier on the user. Now, again, ISR evil grade has largely been kind of, kind of, rotting, bit rotting, um, because, uh, and we pulled it out of most of the courseware, at least from a lab standpoint, um, because, uh, well, you know, at the end of the day, we're seeing more and more ubiquitous uh, TLS. Um, now, if you turn around, and you have a certificate validation issue, um, that doesn't matter anymore, because you can spoof whoever, uh, you know, you can spoof uh, whoever is, uh, or basically the, the software site uh, that's requesting that, uh, uh, basically requesting that, that data or sorry, the software side is providing that, that update. Um, also worth mentioning here too, a lot of updates today, and this is maddening to me, um, are still being delivered over HTTPS, or sorry, over HTTP in plain text, 
Um, and uh, this is largely, I think, because of CDNs, uh, content distribution networks. Um, but we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of updates being sent over plain text. And then the security of the update relies on the certificate validation, meaning um, that there's a check for the, uh, basically a check to see, um, was this signed by, uh, signed by a trusted, uh, trusted certificate? And they take the combination of those, uh, uh, basically the combination of, hey, um, was signed by a trusted certificate, we're good. Um, and, and say, okay, game on, the HTTP didn't matter. Now, uh, look, at the end of the day, uh, even if you're getting served over HTTPS, we just talked a minute ago about how the attacker can man in the middle effectively um, and appear to be a legitimate web server. Of course, they can appear to be a legitimate update server as well, right? Um, so I think this is probably our nightmare scenario. Now, um, look, uh, if, if your third-party software does certificate pinning, um, during the update, uh, then the check mitigates this, right? But there's a lot of third-party software that we use all the time um, that does, doesn't uh, use certificate pending, and some of it's not signed at all. This is a very, very common thing that we find um, in penetration testing and red team assessments. And, um, you know, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, going in and, and taking a look at, normally it's more of a red team style thing where we're, we're deep diving individual apps, um, but the software update process is an absolute mess. It's just an absolute mess. Um, for, for a lot of third-party software. And, and here, um, you know, basically you have the ability or an attacker could have the ability to go bypass even, I won't say the best written, the best written rely on certificate pinning. But, but, but again, you know, we talk a lot about CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, you know, the obviously uh, code signing is an integrity, uh, an integrity move or integrity issue. Um, but uh, certificate pinning can cause issues with availability, right? If they have to go cycle that certificate out and how do you then deploy the update and the, you know, in, in an ideal world, no problems get caused, but we don't live in that ideal world, right? So, so anyway, um, so that's my big nightmare scenario. My big three attack scenarios we talked about, they're intercepting, uh, basically intercepting encrypted traffic. Um, obviously, uh, the second one there, uh, whitelist bypass or application security control bypass. I'll mention that several antivirus vendors, though I won't be mentioning names, um, pay a lot less attention heuristically to uh, files that are digitally signed. Uh, most of them rely on the crypto API, right? So uh, to validate, uh, basically validate those signatures. So anyway, whatever that's worth. Um, can you get a proof of concept uh, to test systems? And the answer there is uh, no, absolutely not. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to shoot in the dark here and say that there are likely multiple researchers that have generated, uh, you know, proof of concepts for this vulnerability. Um, no responsible security professional is going to be sharing this um, hours or days after a vulnerability like this gets patched. Uh, if you're thinking about pushing this to GitHub right now, um, wow, uh, we need to talk, right? Um, but uh, look, I'm all for the release of offensive tools, offensive security tools or OST. I've been all the rage recently. There's been a lot of discussion up around that and, you know, should they be released, et cetera. I'm not going to get into that debate here uh, too much other than to say that um, this is far too early to release a tool for testing. Um, and look, the, the second, even if it's just sent to quote, trusted organizations, right, to be able to go forward certificates and whatnot, it, it'll get out there, it always gets out there, right? So I'm kind of in that mode of like, eh, probably too soon to, to be sharing stuff around like that. And look, at the end of the day, patch your stuff and you don't have an issue anyway, right? Um, so uh, closing thoughts, right? Uh, probably not gonna run a full hour on this, um, but uh, you know, we'll certainly answer some questions here. I have another webcast I have to jump to uh, momentarily, so I'm out 10 minutes ahead of the top of the hour anyway. I want to mention here that this was bad, uh, but it's far from as far from as bad as it could have been. It could have been far, far worse than it was, right? Um, nightmare scenarios would have obviously involved unsupported OS versions. That's not the case here. Uh, huge, huge, huge kudos to NSA uh, for turning, over, uh, turning this over to Microsoft to patch. Um, obviously, this flaw was here. Um, obviously, uh, you know, they, they located it. Um, they have a mission uh, that involves, you know, offensive and defensive security. Um, I, I'm sure the decision to turn this over wasn't easy. Um, and, uh, you know, ba basically from an offense versus defense mission, I, I think this is absolutely the right call here. Um, and, uh, and wow. Um, and, and again, just a huge, huge kudos to, to them for, for, for doing that. And Microsoft as well for, for getting a patch. Um, obviously, patch now, right, as far as action steps, patch now. I don't have a whole lot else out there other than patch now um, and watch out for uh, these application event log entries. I, I highly recommend um, knowing about the CV event rate. I highly recommend that you forward your uh, forward application event logs, at least anything uh, that involves that, that CVE, um, but basically uh, it involves that uh, tag CV. Uh, make sure that you forward that to your SEM, right? Because you, you may be missing 
uh, you know, obviously anytime you see this, I, I would expect very, very limited false positives on this, but anytime you see this, that, that's something worth investigating, right? It, it's, it's almost like getting the antivirus alert, right? The, the, we dodged a bullet here kind of thing, right? Uh, again, most obvious attack opportunities involve man in the middle, uh, other, uh, or monkey in the middle, whatever you want to work with there. We were talking off air here, cat in the middle, because um, cats are evil. Uh, take your pick there or whatever. Um, but uh, other scenarios are certainly possible. Uh, you know, again, post-exploitation, this has uh, some interesting uh, some interesting opportunities there. But, but honestly, uh, once you're you know, once your system, uh, system level privileges, uh, post-exploitation, you can just install new root certificates anyway, and, and it's, it's game over, right? Um, I think this is far more likely to be used by APT attackers and less skilled attackers. Already talked about that as well. Um, and uh, I, I think that's pretty much where, uh, yeah, pretty much where we're going to leave it there. Uh, Johannes, uh, I think you're doing Q&A here. Uh, let's fire up a couple of questions, and I'll try to handle them as, as best I can. Caveating, of course, that, that uh, again, I, I don't have a working proof of concept here, so I can't answer everything. Uh, fire. Yeah, and uh, I first will give you a chance to breathe and answer the first question myself. Uh, oh, yes. uh, that uh, came up multiple times, and that sort of clarification on which operating systems are vulnerable, which ones are not vulnerable. I think it's pretty straightforward. Windows 10, Windows Server 2016, Windows Server 2019, they are vulnerable. Anything older is not vulnerable. They use script32.dll, they use a crypto API. You'll find this file in Windows 7 and older operating systems, but these older versions are not vulnerable. I think that's sort of the, uh, the quick summary here, just to clarify this, and I know, Jake, you mentioned it a couple times. Now, the one thing I'll bounce here to you, Jake, is Windows 10, of course, has become like the multiple operating systems. Instead of calling it Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows 12, they call it now Windows 10 version 1703, and uh, which was end of life last year. Uh, do you think that's vulnerable? You know, I, I, to be honest, uh, that, that's something that uh, that I wanted to uh, wanted to get into yesterday and start mm -hmm. taking a look at the uh, start taking a look at, at the actual uh, uh, vulnerability path. And like I mentioned, I woke up, you know, flu chills, whatever, yesterday. So um, I uh, yeah, I haven't gotten around to that. But my my gut is yes. Um, you know, I looked across uh, 1803, 1809. Uh, 1903 and I think 1909, um, and, and all of those were vulnerable. So my, my gut is that it, that it is, but but I, I I can't verify that for sure. If you're but but I mean hey, as a practical matter, if you're on uh, 17 you know 1703 or an unsupported version, update right. I mean I, I think is is the you should be upgrading that that version. I know that's painful. I know Microsoft has made uh, great strides in trying to make that less painful on the enterprise side, but. But the short of it is, um, go, go update. I, I, I think is, is you know, th this this should not be the deciding line for, for whether or not you, you upgrade. Uh, there are other worse remote remotely exploitable stuff uh, that hasn't been patched um, in uh, and local privilege escalation um, in those older versions of Windows 10. Well, would you agree with that, Johannes? Uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, there's it's probably the worst thing that you need uh, to be worried about than this vulnerability and when it comes to some of these older versions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're not getting support for, for the remote code execution stuff. This can lead to RCE uh, yeah. in, in, in certain scenarios. But but again, this is not going to be how an attacker, comp unlikely to be how the attacker compromises you um, if, uh, if you're using an older unsupported version that hasn't gotten patches for a year. And uh, another question actually was, uh, no, is this potentially warmable? I would say no. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, I wouldn't sort of see this. I'm sorry, can, can you say again? Is, is, it, is it a warmable vulnerability? Oh, goodness, no. No, no I would I, say no. It, yeah. Yeah, actually, I, mean, I see it more as a targeted attack vulnerability, or it's, it's not sort of a big mass attack issue necessarily. Uh, that's at least my feeling on it, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we mentioned Flame, uh, or I mentioned Flame earlier on, uh, you know, and, and Flame was another certificate, or Flame was a piece of malware, but one of the exploit vectors that it used to propagate um, was a, uh, uh, basically was a, uh, a man in the middle uh, where it would do ARP cache poisoning and then use, uh, basically spoof Windows updates uh, using a trusted certificate um, and uh, in terminal services licensing. Um, and, and so, so that was definitely warmable. There's no question about that. Um, I, I think uh, this one uh, less so, but but largely because you know Windows, uh, you know Windows Update or Microsoft did a great job securing Windows Update. 
I mean, I suppose there's a possibility. I can think of a few pieces of software um, that we've looked at, at least in the past. Uh, I'm not going to spit names out here, but but that will look for updates, uh, you know, basically broadcast out or multicast out on a local subnet to see if anybody else has already downloaded an update, right? Meaning, um, so, so like you don't have centralized uh, third-party patch management, um, but as the software itself goes to check for the update, um, you know, it does the quick broadcast, almost like multicast DNS, right? And says, hey, does anybody else on my local subnet already have this? I mean, in those scenarios, eh, but I mean, I, I, again, what we're stretching here, uh, I think the short of it is that the, the TLDR is no with a little tiny asterisk beside it um, in super unique scenarios where you are already vulnerable, likely to some other issues, maybe. Yeah, and uh, then there was an other question that came a couple times here and I'm <coughs> just um, looking up the answer and that's the knowledge base uh, number for this patch. Do you have it handy? Was just going to look it up uh, quickly here because I can never remember uh, those numbers. No, uh, I never uh, remember the, the number either. If you search I, Microsoft and the CB 2020 yeah. 0601, yeah. you're going to find it immediately. And that's here, a four five three four two seven three. That's the knowledge base uh, article number. Uh, may actually depend a little bit, I think, on the operating system version that you're running, uh, but uh, that's uh, that's what you're looking for here. It doesn't have a catchy name, and that's what's a little bit missing here from this vulnerability. Uh, so nothing that, uh, and uh, one type of question that I've seen a couple of times was that uh, people were asking, you know, what else does it affect? And I just want to throw out a couple of things here. Uh, DNS over TLS, uh, does it affect mm -hmm. that? Uh, what else uh, did we have any client authentication? Um, like, you know, LDAP authentication, so anything that uses TLS uh, certificates for authentication, PEEP, uh, any, guesses on you know what authentication methods could possibly be affected here i mean if you're doing certificate based authentication uh you know certainly uh i, I would say that, that that could again if it's certificate based authentication i'm trying to think of you know like in a lot of certificate uh, scenarios right like in in the vpn that we use at my company um it, it's certificate and, and password based as well as then multi-factor but um, you know, the certificate's pinned, right? So it's not just, it's a trusted certificate. It is, this is your certificate, right? Um, so that we can individually go revoke. So I, I guess um, I would say, depending on how you have that set up, maybe for like VPN uh, pre-authentication, I, I mean, this this is, yeah, <clears throat> I, I think that's, that's probably, I can't think of a lot of scenarios where we do purely certificate-based off, you know, certificate-based off. Um, yeah. Most scenarios I can think of, that, that's a predecessor to, to requesting a password. What about other update mechanisms like AV updates and uh, browser updates and such? Uh, do you think that some of them will be vulnerable? Yeah, I think largely that's going to fall into uh, largely. I think that's going to fall into the, uh, the the broader software update mechanism uh, channel there, right? But uh, but sure, I, I think browser updates. I think AV updates uh, could be as well. Um, I, I can't think of an antivirus that uh, you know for most antiviruses under the hood, or at least the ones I've reverse engineered, use the Windows APIs. Um, they, they use, at least for downloading updates, they use the WinINET, uh, WinINET API. And WinINET, uh, understandably, uses crypt, uh, basically the, the crypto API to establish those TLS sessions. So I, I guess the short of it is, if you're not coding your own, if you haven't patched and you're not coding your own, uh, uh, your own crypto libraries, then, then yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, it's vulnerable. And actually, uh, Salim Rashid, who I think you mentioned uh, with the proof of concept exploit, uh, he just sort of posted a screenshot of a fake GitHub website that he created yeah. using a fake certificate. So uh, the attacks are definitely out there already. Any guesses on how long it will take for a public proof of concept? I A public proof of concept. I mean, guesses, uh, I, I guessed wrong with Lukey. All right. I, I figured that uh, folks would, once they had weaponized uh, or even even crash, uh, you know, basic crash trigger files, they would they would publicize those quickly, um, and uh, they didn't. Right? There there was a huge amount of restraint from the community um, on that, uh, and uh, that didn't happen. So um, you know, predictions, bold predictions are bold, I guess. But uh, I, I guess I would say that um, I, I'm not sure uh, with something like this. I think if you're no self-respecting researcher is going to go drop a a proof of concept here, you know, days after the fact. Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, as we get into, uh, you know, we're rolling into ShmooCon here in a couple of weeks, it wouldn't surprise me to see one drop there or, or quickly ahead of there, rolling into uh, RSA, um, you know, after that, uh, definitely buy RSA, how about that? I mean, we, we can chart 
around. So Blue Keep eventually went public uh, right before Black Hat, right? People sat on it. It was good. Everything was fine. And then Black Hat popped up and bam, uh, we, we saw a public, uh, you know, proof of concept for Blue Keep. Um, I, I think a lot of this is going to is, is gonna focus around that cycle. I just don't know whether it's going to be ShmooCon or RSA or heck, maybe somebody irresponsibly drops on today. But I'm going to call a spade a spade and say that's irresponsible this early. Yeah, and uh, I totally agree with you. It's always really hard to predict this. Uh, I've just, uh, during the webcast, seen some researcher published a blog post, actually, uh, with very specific details on what went wrong here. So, uh, you know, stuff like this always helps uh, with uh, yeah. creating the mortability. I think it still requires some understanding of elliptic curve cryptography, yeah. uh, just skimming over this blog post to create a bad certificate. And you know, so that probably keeps the script kiddies out of it a little bit. Unlike the Netscaler vulnerability, which was so trivial where uh, you had like you know, the script kiddies basically jump in uh, very quickly there. Uh, I know you have to run. So uh, I want to do one a little bit of out of bound question here. Uh, in the shadow of this vulnerability, you had two remote code execution vulnerabilities yes. in remote desktop gateway uh, yesterday. Uh, do you rate them more severe than this one? Oh yeah, w without without a doubt, this is the one that got all the hype. Um, and uh, you know, I'll tell you that ahead of um, ahead of this, uh, we, we had advance notice that there was. I say advance notice uh, through Wisp, we'll call it WhisperNet um, that uh, there was a crypto vulnerability coming. And then separately, we knew that there were um, RCEs, remote code executions, and all supported versions of Windows. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that we conflated the two. We we used a little bit of confirmation bias and thought that. Um, you know, basically this was going to be an all supported versions and Microsoft was rating this an RCE because it could be used to impact update mechanisms. Um, but I'll tell you, no, 100%, the, the remote desktop gateway stuff is probably more important. And in fact, it's not just the RD gateway, it's the terminal services client as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So the terminal services client is vulnerable if you can trick uh, the, through any number of mechanisms, uh, trick or man in the middle, um, a, uh, basically a client trying to connect to a server. Um, you can actually infect the client there as well. I guess the difference is that the crypto stuff affects every single copy of Windows 10, while not a lot of people necessarily run RD Gateway. Yeah, I think that's probably the uh, pro probably the big point there, right? Is the, um, the the criticality of the criticality of the vulnerability. And again, remember it's in the RDP client too, but your average user doesn't RDP the stuff all all, all the time there. Um, that that said, I think the criticality is higher on the RDP side. I think the um, you know, the impacted user base obviously is larger here because it, as you point out, it's every version of Windows 10, uh, Server 2016, Server 2019 um, versus the, you know, only those that are running or, or using that service. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So I let you uh, run here, Jake. Thanks uh, again for your help here, clearing up some of this. A recording will be available. Uh, so you just go to the same URL that you went to when you registered for uh, this webcast. There will also be slides. I know I didn't get to all um, questions. We have 106 open questions here. Uh, can possibly do that. Yeah, uh, we will publish an Internet Storm Center blog within the hour where I will answer some of these questions. So. Um, if your question wasn't answered, double check there. I'll also answer so some of these FAQs that we uh, keep uh, have coming in. Uh, so, uh, and please share, you know, please share if you see any exploit attempts in particular with the alert uh, being um, now added to Windows 10, that should make that quite a bit easier. Yeah, so yes, yeah, but please don't share a proof of concept, right? Yeah, no yeah. proof of concepts, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you.